Good evening. Are you relatives of the deceased? Uh, no, no. Uh, just very close friends. Mr. and Mrs. Claude Archer. How do you do? I'm Mr. Charles. We're handling the arrangements. How do you do? Is Eileen, Mrs. Robinson here? Uh, not at the moment, but she should be back shortly. I told her she simply had to get off her feet for a while. People have been coming in steadily since 10.30 this morning. I can imagine. Mr. Robinson must have had a lot of friends. Yes, he did. Ed was a wonderful man. If, if you'd care to go in and pay your respects. Oh, uh, in a moment, thanks. We'll, uh, we'll wait until Mrs. Robinson comes back. Certainly. Oh, you'll excuse me? Some more people just come in? Sure, thanks. I, I think you'll find chairs in the foyer. Thanks. I don't see our flowers, Claude. Oh, they're probably in the other room. Let's sit down here where we can watch the door. Oh, I still can't get used to it. It happened so quickly. I never heard Ed complain of having any heart trouble. Well, never bothered him very much, I guess. Didn't Eileen say he had rheumatic fever once, uh, when he was a kid? Yes. Claude, do you think the campaign... Had... I've been wondering about that myself, honey. No, I don't think so. It's been four months since the primary. Mm. What'll they do now? Pick someone else to run for mayor in his place? Yes, they'll have to. And there goes everything we were trying to do. How? Well, you know how the organization people fought Ed in the primary. Well, he beat them. He won the nomination. But it's a state law that when a candidate for office dies, his uh, replacement on the ticket is selected by the party central committee. Well, I still don't see. Well, the, the central committee is run by Clarence Ward and all the other people who opposed Ed in the primary. They'll probably slate Landers or some other candidate they can do business with. And there goes your reform movement. You know, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, well, maybe it's just as well this way. Ed didn't have the temperament for politics any more than I have. You huh? managed his campaign for him. He won the nomination, didn't well, he? A couple of lucky amateurs, that's all we were. In a really hot primary fight, they would have run us ragged. Why, Claude, I've never heard you talk like this before. I'm tired, honey. I'll be 40 years old next January. <laughs> I thought of that this afternoon. And I'm in the insurance business, not politics. Besides, there's, there's nothing I can do about it anymore. I think I'll step outside for a smoke. How about you? No, you go ahead. I feel like sitting. I'll only be a few minutes. Take your time. The air will do you good. Excuse me, please. Uh, excuse me, please. Thank you. Oh, is, is that you, Claude? All right. Yes, who... Uh, Clarence Ward. Just going in to pay my respects. Oh. Good evening, Ward. You all alone? No, no. Sam Jones and Randall drove over with me. They're parking the car. Oh? Uh, look, I realize we've had our differences, Claude, but after all, we both knew Ed pretty well. Of course, this, this isn't any time to let that end of the picture. You no, know. but, uh, Claude, I, I've been thinking. I guess you realize that Ed's death puts the job of slating the man to run in his place up to the committee. I realize it. Well, I'd like your advice on the matter. My advice? Why is that surprising? You helped Ed win the nomination last spring and you did it without our support? Well, what do you want me to do? How about having lunch with me tomorrow? Maybe you can suggest someone. Why don't you go to the newspapers? They could give you some ideas. They already have. I'd like to tell you about it. Uh, how about Fritz's at one o'clock? All right, Clarence. I'll have lunch with you. Good. Oh, uh, are you alone here tonight? No, no, Jane came with me. Uh -huh. In fact, she's probably wondering what kept me out here so long. I'd, uh, I'd better be getting back. Yes, well, give her my best. Yeah. I'll see you at Fritz's, Claude. I'll be there. Yes. Yes, I think you will. Claude? Yeah? Haven't you been asleep at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I dropped off once. Are you worried about that meeting you have with Clarence Ward tomorrow? <laughs> no, not really worried. You know what he's going to ask. Uh, I wish I did. He's going to ask you to run for mayor in Ed's place? <laughs> oh, no, he's not. I don't think that's it. Oh, Claude, act your age. I'd just be a big headache to them. Besides, I don't want to be mayor. You wouldn't like it, the kids wouldn't like it, and... Well, there's... There's more to it than a simple yes or no. Like what? Well, for one thing, I wouldn't run for mayor, except on the same terms that Ed laid down. I'd publicly renounce the support of Jones and Randall. Why well, wouldn't Ward accept those terms? He took them from Ed. He had to. Ed was the elected nominee. And... Yes, and if Clarence Ward's one half the smart politician everyone says he is, then he must have realized why Ed was the elected nominee. 
Because he promised the people to run men like Jones and Randall out of power. Oh, honey, don't oversimplify Are you trying the... to say it wasn't the people who gave Ed the nomination? Of course not. I know it was the people. Huh. Why, Ed brought out folks in that primary that hadn't been to the polls in years. Ed and you brought them out. And now Ed's gone, so Clarence Ward has come to you. Why, he knows a good thing when he sees it. <laughs> well, we'll... we'll see tomorrow. Oh, no. You'll see. <laughs> More coffee, Claude? No, thanks. Two cups are my limit. <laughs> Don't tell me you've got a bad heart. <laughs> no, nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, have a cigar? Oh, thanks, I will. Yeah, yeah. Well, we might as well get back to business again. Now, this is the picture. Correct me if I'm wrong. You will accept run for mayor as the organization candidate, but only if Randall and Jones are out. I'm afraid that's it, Clarence. You realize, of course, that as chairman of the Central Committee, I can't throw them out. They're duly elected ward committeemen. They have every legal right in the world to sit on that committee. I don't think there's much doubt as to how they were elected ward committeemen. Claude, I'll tell you how they were elected. People voted for them. But what kind of people? Floaters, derelicts. Man who tell if it's an emergency, send someone with a written message. Very well. Goodbye, Frau Brenner. Goodbye, and thank you. Uh... Is anything wrong? What are you looking at? I thought I saw someone across the street. There's no one I can see. When I came in, there was a man out there. A man? In front of this office? Yes. He followed me over from Steffensplatz. Are you sure? Did you see his face? No. Was he in uniform? No, he, he was wearing a black greatcoat. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's probably just a prowler. Uh, wait a moment. What are you going to do, Gottfried? Uh, step outside, see who it is. But is that wise? I am the commandant's personal physician. If I behave overcautiously, someone may begin to think I have something to hide. Even so? It's probably just some loiterer. I'll send him packing. Uh, close the door. Your husband is a brave and generous man. He is also a fool. Can you see anyone through the glass? No. The street is black. Perhaps your prowler has gone. Oh, I wish now I had gotten closer so I might have seen his face. Why is Gottfried taking so long? Perhaps he walked up to the corner to... No. Here he comes. Where? From out of the shadows across the street. Why, he's almost running. Something is wrong. Oh, what could have happened? Here. Let me open the door. Gottfried. Be quiet, Maria. Frau Brenner, you will have to leave by the back way. I don't understand. I want you to get out, not come back. But not for Fain any reason. No, 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 any reason at all. You must get another doctor. Can't you even tell me? I can tell you this. My family is not going to the gallows. Not for you or your husband or all the patriots in Austria. So forget you know me. Forget you have ever heard my name. <laughs> Five minutes later, I reached the mouth of the alley that led from the rear of the doctor's office back to Waldstrausser. For a few moments after I turned into the street, I almost believed that my unknown pursuer had abandoned me. But then I heard it again, the sound of the crunching under his heavy step. I kept walking. All I could remember was the look of terror on Dr. Koenig's face when he ordered me out. As I passed the opera house, chimes in a distant steeple struck nine o'clock. It was another half hour before I arrived at the apartment building just across from the west end of the half garden. I looked back once more. I could see him dimly now, tall and hulking under a street lamp that sent a faint flickering light through the wintry fog. For just a moment as I watched, he seemed to hesitate, and in that moment I slipped through the shadows to the door, opened it and stepped inside. I climbed the staircase slowly, on tiptoe, pausing at each landing to listen. Finally, at the door leading to the attic, I stopped. Mother. Has anyone been here, Julie? No, no one. Father has been restless, so I was reading to He's him. awake? Yes. I, I think I've been followed. Followed? 
I'm going in to talk to your father. I want you to stay right here by the door and listen. All right. And if you hear anything at all, out on the stairs, down on the landing, come and tell me right away. Good. Hello, Louisa. Did you see Dr. Koenig? Yes, dear. He gave me some medicine for you. Oh, he's a generous man. Good. Something's happened. I was followed tonight. Followed? By a man, not a soldier. I first saw him near Dr. Koenig's office at the Valstrasse. And all the time I was there, he waited outside and then followed me back here. But he did not stop you. No, but... Good, if he knows you're here or even suspects... That doesn't sound like the Gestapo. It's a, even an inkling there would be four of them breaking down the door, not one lone man. Then who else could it be? <sighs> Perhaps a member of the underground? Some of the others who escaped could have made contact and told them about me? Good. Two of your companions were captured. When? This morning. Dr. Kernet heard it at the commandant's. Did he learn the names? No, but... If they knew you were wounded, the Gestapo might have gotten it out of them. Mother. Mother. What is it? Out on the staircase, I, I thought I heard footsteps down on the landing. Go back and keep listening. Louisa, no. We haven't any choice. But one pistol won't help? It might if there's only one man. What if you are wrong and you kill someone who is innocent? And what if I'm not and you are killed? You and Julie, all of us. Louisa, listen, please. There was a password and a counter sign we used to use. It is an old one, but if this man is a member of the underground, he'll remember it. Now, you say, it is a warm night, and he should answer, it is warmer in Berlin. And if that is not his answer? Keep the pistol hidden in your coat. Mother... We heard it, Julie. What should we do? You stay here with your father. No matter what happens, don't open the door. Louisa, before you do anything, make sure. I'll try to, Court. And be careful. Come in. Didn't you hear me knock? What do you want? I want to help you. What do you mean, help? I think you know. Who are you? I, I am not an enemy, Frau Brenner. It, it is a warm night. What did you say? I said, it's a warm night. I wish I could agree with you. I'm half frozen. I thought so. Frau Brenner. Don't move. No, you are making a mistake. I have no gun. Yes, soon, see. Put up your hands. As you wish, but... I Turn have... around. I want only to help your husband. I'm not an informer. Then why was Dr. Koenig so afraid of you tonight? Oh, because I chose to frighten him. He is the commandant's physician. I don't trust him. Lift up your hands higher. I tell you, I have no gun. Mm, apparently not. Let us see what can be learned from the papers in your wallet. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Sorry, Frau Brenner. Oh. My arm. Let go of your gun. No, please, let go of it. Thank you. I should have shot you when I had the chance. Oh, no, no. That would have been most unwise. I repeat, Frau Brenner, I, I am neither an informer nor a member of the Gestapo. Then who are you? No more than a, a, a civil servant. I, I perform the same task now that I did under the old regime before the Nazis ever came. No, but that's unimportant. I, I have come here to help your husband uh, and to ask a favor. What makes you think my husband is here? Oh, you made two trips to see Dr. Koenig this week. At the chemist, you purchased dressings and alcohol. Was the pastor badly wounded? Julie, I told you not. That's all right, Louisa. Ask the gentleman to come in. I trust him. This way. Have we ever met, sir? No. No, but I heard you preach a few times in the old days. How is it you think that you can help us? When you are strong enough to leave the city, 
you will need papers, money. Yeah. Uh, and you can get these things for us? I, I can try. It will take time, but I have friends in the regime, uh, clerks, non-entities like myself. In their own way, people of that sort can be very helpful. And what is the favor you want in return for this? Oh, it is a, it is a little thing, and, and only after your husband is much stronger. But what is it? I would like to hear you, you preach again. Uh, but where? They are forbidden any assembly of more than three people. The risk would be too great. No, no, I, I don't mean a real sermon in the church. I, I, I meant if perhaps I could just to come here once in a while, when you are stronger and hear you talk. You know, we, we never, never hear talk like that anymore. Yeah, I know. And whatever faith or hope and, and love that we had, it seems to be frightened out of us. But you, Pastor, you are an example of the courage that we need. And we'll need even more of it as the end comes closer. How do you mean? Oh, they, they, these Nazis, they have frightened themselves now. You remember the reprisal hangings two years ago when the Gauleiter was shot? Yeah, I heard something from one of our guards. Louisa... I did not want to tell you. Dr. Koenig says they are thinking of it again. Because of us? Of our escape? Oh, if it were not that, it would be something else. But I won't have more hangings on my account. I will give myself up first. No, no, no. They would simply hang you with the others. That would save no one. Were, were you working for them two years ago when the last hostages were taken? No, I, I had no part in that. Although a friend of mine worked in the very office where the lists were drawn up. How could you stand to look at him? It, it was done by lottery, every fifth name. No, with the SS looking over his shoulder, there is nothing a man can do. I would still not consider him guiltless. What could he have done? What could any of us do? That was the group including Archbishop Mueller, was it not? Yeah. Yeah. He died forgiving his persecutors. Like a saint. You were present at the hangings? No, it, it was an order. Every civil servant was checked. No one dared to stay away. Poor man. No, no, Pastor Brenner, before I leave... Must you? It, oh, I am afraid so, yes. It is long past curfew, but... I, I would like to give you something in case... In case we do not meet again. But surely you'll be back. Oh, I will make every effort, but just in case, you know. Uh, here, it's wrapped in this small box. Oh, may we look at it? Oh, when, when I have gone, Frau Brenner. Of course. Yeah. One last thing, Pastor, huh? Yeah. I know the man who owns this building, and as long as you remain here, you will be safe. So, when can we next expect to see you? Perhaps a month. I will come again when you are a little stronger. Hmm? Now, I must go. No, I'll see you to the door. Goodbye, young lady. Goodbye. Goodbye, Pastor. Goodbye, and thank you. We still don't know who you are. Can't you even tell us your name? My name is not important. Uh, I would prefer that you think of me simply as an unfortunate civil servant who has had to follow orders. As you wish. Goodbye, Frau Brenner. Goodbye. Has he gone, Louisa? Yes, he's gone. What a strange man. Yeah, very strange. And greatly troubled, too. Can we see it, Mama? See what, dear? What he gave you in the little box. Oh, I think so. Good? Yeah, by all means, open it. Very well. What uh, is it, Mama? Why, it's a ring. A ring? Let me see it. Here. What a strange thing to give us. <sighs> Not so strange. What do you mean? 
I have seen this ring before. It was a symbol of his religious authority. Whose authority? The man who was hanged, Archbishop Muller. From that day on, the mystery that hung about the dark stranger deepened. Although the results of his efforts were all about us, a few weeks after his visit, I received by mail an envelope containing almost 500 marks. Within another two months, the postman delivered us a small, flat package containing three forged travel visas and a letter of credit to a bank in Switzerland. By now, it was spring of 1945, and the Allied armies had pushed deep into Germany and Austria. Our temptation to use the forged visas was overcome only by good certainty that in a month at most we would be liberated. We had almost given up hope of ever seeing our mysterious benefactor again when late one cool night during the last week of the war he paid us a visit. I can stay only a short while, but I, I wanted to see you once more. Once more? Man, in a matter of weeks we'll be free again. To see each other as often as we wish. And then we will show you our gratitude, really show it to oh, you. No, no, you owe me nothing. <laughs> At least I owe you a sermon. No, no. <laughs> you never even came to hear me talk, and I was so flattered. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I, I wanted to, but I couldn't. <laughs> Sermons can be pretty dusty. Huh? <laughs> you are wise to stay away. Perhaps not. That's one of the reasons I, I came to see you tonight. What's that? You... Long time ago, you delivered a sermon. I think it was in Linz. I read it in the paper. It, the subject was courage. The courage when you are being wronged by others. Do you remember? Yeah, indeed I do. It was that sermon which sent me to the concentration camp. Yeah, do you really remember it? I mean, the actual words? Oh, sure. Most of them. There were times during my captivity when those words were all that sustained me. Now, would you say that for me? Just for me, here? Well, if you wish, but it's a rather long sermon. That's almost half an hour. Oh, yes, I, I, if you'd rather not... I no, 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 I, I am flattered. Uh, Louisa? Oh, we'd please. love to hear it. Uh, all right, I... Uh, I think it began... Uh, in, in times like this, we have only one, one voice that tells us right from wrong. The small voice within us from God. The voice of our conscience. I watched the stranger's face as Court spoke. At first his expression seemed unsure and troubled. But then, gradually, I felt he was actually drawing physical strength from the words he was hearing. Court spoke of man's obligation to his fellow man. He spoke of the thin, shadowy line between cowardice and bravery, between responsibility and irresponsibility. And then, finally summing up, his voice low and wonderfully persuasive, he returned to man's conscience the one true voice of right when everything else seems wrong. When Court had finished his sermon, the stranger rose, and after a few polite words, departed. Less than five days later, the American soldiers arrived, and we were free men and women again. And that would have been the last we ever saw or knew of the dark stranger if it had not been for an incident that occurred nearly two months later on the sidewalk in front of the doctor's office where I had first come to know him. Oh, Frau Brenner, it is good to see you. Dr. Koenig, how is your wife? Very well. And your husband, the good pastor? Completely recovered. We leave for Lens tomorrow. He's been given his old parish. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, incidentally, have you been following the war trials? In Berlin? No, oh, that, of course, but I mean the local ones. No, no, I haven't. That's very interesting. They brought in three more convictions yesterday. Look, uh, it's right here in the paper. Mm, I don't pay much attention. Uh, you wish you had. Uh, yeah. Remember that one? 
the man in the center picture? Uh, has, has he been on trial? That's the man. Stood out in the dark that night less than a year ago and, and scared me half to death. Right here on this street. But why? What are they doing to him? They're giving him the gallows. That's what they're doing. And who deserves it more? But what did he do? Do? He was it. He was the hangman all through the reprisals. Hangman? All through it. He, he pulled the trapdoor on better than 50 of his countrymen, including Archbishop Merla. Archbishop Merla? Frau Brenner, what's wrong? Don't you feel well? He gave us the bishop's ring. What ring? The one he, he must have worn to the gallows. Uh, Frau Brenner, t take hold of yourself. Oh, the poor, poor man. There. Uh, it's over now. All over. The occupation is finished. Yes. Yes, it is. And all through it, there was a heart in the hangman where none was found in all Austria. This is Bill Bendix again. Like the hundreds of guests who have appeared on Family Theater, I spend most of my time trying to make people laugh, trying to make them take their minds off themselves. But that isn't enough to make them happy. Sooner or later, people have to stop laughing and start thinking. They have to put their minds on themselves. They have to reflect. Yes, reflect on how each of us is lost unless we have faith and hope in a God to whom we can bring our troubles and pray for help. That's the reason for family theater. Just a weekly reminder that all of us, and especially our families, need God and should pray to him. If you've been neglecting prayer, why not start today with your family about you in the circle of your home? Find out for yourself that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Reprisal, starring Teresa Wright. William Bendix was your host. Others in our cast were Irene Tedrow, Anne Whitfield, Ben Wright, Lawrence Dobkin, and Lou Krugman. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Beauty and the Brain, starring Richard Denning and Gene Cagney. Vic Damone will be your host. Join us, won't you? <music> Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. <laughs> <laughs>